Greetings, this is Greg. It's time to discuss manifold pressure as it pertains to World War II aircraft. This is a concept that's important to understand. It's so important, I would say, you can't fully understand certain issues with various World War II fighters unless you understand manifold pressure. It's not too complicated, so let's go over it. There is a certain amount of atmospheric pressure pushing on us all the time. That amount varies day by day and to a small extent, even moment by moment. However, we have to have some sort of standard value for reference, and the people that decide standard values for reference have set this at 14.7 pounds per square inch at sea level. Naturally, people in other countries use different systems of measurement and also sometimes slightly different values as the base standard. As an example, in the U.S., we generally measure this in inches of mercury, and 14.7 pounds per square inch equals 29.92 inches of mercury. U.S. aircraft in World War II, during that era, used inches of mercury to measure manifold pressure, but the British usually used pounds per square inch. The Germans typically used units of the standard atmosphere, which they called ATA, or A-T-A, which actually makes the most sense to me. And the Japanese like to use millimeters of mercury. For the most part, I'll be using the P-51 Mustang and inches of mercury for this discussion, but I'll touch on the German system a bit as well. So, here we are. We're sitting in our airplane. It's a Dora 9. But it could be any World War II piston engine airplane. The engine isn't running, so atmospheric pressure is everywhere, including in the intake manifold. Since it's a, quote, standard day, unquote, at sea level, pressure is currently 29.92 inches. Now, we start the engine, and it's idling. Since the engine is running at idle, something has to be preventing it from running up to max power. That, of course, is the throttle. The throttle is closed, thus blocking air from entering the intake manifold, at least blocking most of the air. Here's a picture of an automotive intake manifold. Since the engine is drawing air in, but the air is partially blocked by the throttle, air pressure in the manifold drops. At idle speeds, it typically drops to about 15 inches of mercury. Automotive guys often call this 15 inches of vacuum, but it's not vacuum, it's just lower pressure. Now as we advance the throttle lever and the throttle opens, more air will be allowed in, manifold pressure and power will increase. On a piston engine aircraft, we usually have a manifold pressure gauge. In a normally aspirated engine, meaning no turbo, no supercharger, at full throttle, we will typically have about atmospheric pressure on a standard day, 29.92 inches of mercury. In some cases, it's going to be slightly less due to losses in the air intake system. You can see on this gauge here, at full throttle, it's going to have about 28.5 inches. Now, we have two problems here. First, every thousand feet we climb decreases the pressure by about one inch of mercury. That costs us about 3% of our horsepower per thousand feet which will really add up. The other problem is we want more power at sea level. In World War II aircraft, both of these problems were typically addressed with a supercharger. The supercharger can raise or boost the manifold pressure above atmospheric values. This can add a lot of power. In fact, with all other factors fixed, an increase in power will be very proportional to the increase in manifold pressure. In other words, an engine with a thousand horsepower at 30 inches of manifold pressure will have about 2,000 horsepower at 60 inches of manifold pressure with all other factors equal. Of course, they're never quite equal. There are losses in creating that boost pressure, but it's close enough for this discussion. Let's look at the manifold pressure gauge on a P-51D Mustang Merlin engine. The Mustang has a manifold pressure limit of 67 inches at war emergency power. This power rating has a 5 minute limitation and it's only usable with specific fuel and oil, uh, but that's the highest limit in this particular plane with this engine, so it's what I'm going to use as an example. 
So 67 inches at sea level means we have about 37 inches of boost, meaning 37 inches above atmospheric pressure. That's a lot. Furthermore, it can maintain 67 inches, in this case up to just over 19,000 feet. Note this is the Dash 7 variant of this engine. Other variants used in the P-51 such as the Dash 3 can maintain 67 inches up to a much higher altitude, but they sacrifice performance in other areas. Atmospheric pressure at 19,000 feet is only 14 inches, so 67 inches of manifold pressure up there equates to 53 inches of boost. That supercharger is working pretty hard up there. For you automotive guys, that's about 26 pounds of boost on a 1650 cubic inch V12. Let's take a look at the P51's engine performance chart. We'll zoom in here on the power and manifold pressure numbers. And you can see that the Dash 7 engine can generate 1,720 horsepower at 6,200 feet at war emergency power. Now, at the same manifold pressure value at 19,300 feet, it's down over 200 horsepower. That's because the supercharger has to work a lot harder up there, and the losses in generating all that boost are higher. At higher altitudes, the supercharger has to generate more boost for a given target manifold pressure, and there's just a cost associated with doing that. But interestingly, let's compare the takeoff ratings to the military power ratings. They're both rated at the same RPM level, 3000, and at 61 inches of manifold pressure. Yet power for the mill rating at 8500 feet is higher than at sea level. What's going on here? we gained 100 horsepower by going up to 8,500 feet, in spite of the need for the more boost it's going to take to reach, six, to reach 61 inches up there. Well, if you watch my video on the ME109 supercharger drive system, you may have already guessed, the P51 supercharger is geared to the engine. That means in both cases here, it's spinning at the same speed. However, down low at sea level, in order to avoid overboost, meaning avoid exceeding the 61 inches of military power, it has to be throttled, meaning it has to have the inlet air cut off so it doesn't overboost. Superchargers hate being throttled. Thus, at 8,500 feet, even though it needs to make more boost, it has an easier time doing it because the throttle is open farther, hence the extra 100 horsepower. By the way, the Russians found an interesting way around this problem. Um, I find it fascinating. I have a video on that as well, link in the description. One of the big advantages of Germany's Daimler-Benz engine in the 109 is that it never needs to throttle its supercharger. Speaking of the 109, the Germans measured manifold pressure in units of atmosphere, which I'm going to call ATA. Some people call it ATA. One ATA, according to Google, is 29.92 inches of mercury, but I can't determine if the Germans used a different scale. They may have based one ATA on 1,000 millibars in war during World War II, which would be 29.53 inches of mercury, but if so, that's only slightly different, so it doesn't matter much for this discussion. Now, there were many models of the 109, but a common max manifold pressure value was 1.42 ATA, which is about 42 and a half inches of mercury, or what we might call six pounds of boost at sea level. Hopefully you now have a decent idea about what manifold pressure is and what effect it has on power. With two engines of equivalent design, size, RPM, the one with more manifold pressure will usually be the one that's more powerful, so it's, very, it's a very important specification. And it's one that's going to matter in some of the future videos on this channel. You may like my video on the 109 supercharger drive system or my video on the unique tail design of the Japanese Zero. I'll put links to those in my description. Please like, subscribe, thanks for watching, and have a great day.